in today's video, we're gonna go over some creepy TikTok conspiracies. Let's get into it. Have y'all ever seen this painting right here from 1546? Does anything look unusual at all about this painting? Are you sure? How about right here, hmm? You know, I posted this picture a while back and a lot of people said, oh, those look like camels, man. I think those are camels, yada, yada, yada. Look closely, I want y'all to look now. It looks like a little guy sitting on top of it. And look at the hump on his back. Look at the neck. Look at the little curve. You know what I'm saying? Here's all the long neck dinosaurs right here. Check them all out. The Brachiosaurus, the Brontosaurus, you know, the long neck. You know, little foot, man. The Lamb Before Time right here. Y'all remember this? Favorite cartoon when I was a kid. It really was. Anyways, while I got y'all's attention, what do y'all think about this right here? This, this is allegedly something petrified, you know, a petrified axle, so to speak. They say that things don't take as long as we think to petrify. So what do y'all think? Those of you that were like, no, I want no axle. Here's a chain from one of the harbors. Look at it petrified right here. So things can petrify quickly. Part two, we're going to talk about the old world buildings. I want you to look at this right here. This is a picture somebody had anyways. I'm not saying it's true. It's probably a legend, yada, yada, yada. We're going to talk about how they harness the ether from the atmosphere to give free electricity, allegedly. I'm not gonna lie, in that painting, it definitely looks like some sort of long neck dinosaur, at least what we are used to seeing as far as a long neck goes. But that could have been like an elephant or something, I really don't know. But the coincidence of that being like a long neck dinosaur looked pretty good. It makes you think, maybe in that time frame, there was actually dinosaurs walking around with people back then. But if that's the case, what made them go extinct all of a sudden? Like, why the next couple of thousands of years, they just disappeared, you know? Can't stop thinking about the theory that JFK's shooter was actually the driver. Forensics has shown over time that the single bullet theory doesn't make any sense. And if you've watched the Sapruder film and you know anything about ballistics, they always said the bullet came from behind him, but that doesn't make sense with the way that he moves. They've also shown that if he was actually hit by Lee Harvey Oswald, the caliber of rifle would have been so high that there would have been a lot more noticeable damage not only to the car, but mess. And ultimately, I think the problem is we were all watching the back seat and we weren't watching the front seat. And I'm going to censor this, but just watch the driver. And it looks like he leans back and reaches over his shoulder with his left hand with a silver weapon. So this is a 4K enhanced version where somebody's taken it up to 96 frames per second. And again, I'm going to be censoring this, but just watch the driver in the very front seat the whole time. It looks almost as, and I'm going to zoom in here, but it looks as though he pulls something over his right shoulder with his left hand. So on this frame, as we see the mist in the air, we also see that same silver object right up here. Now, I've double-checked, this is not the collars of their shirt showing. Before going forward, though, I do want to say it's possible it could be the lighting off the other man's hair. But first off in this, they always said that it came from behind. But again, he's hit backwards into the seat, and then he rebounds off of the seat. And they would have to be up really high not to hit the windshield or anything else around it. But then they did hit the governor who was in the middle section. They looked for the shooter in every other place, buildings, the grassy knoll, but did they ever really look inside the car? Now this kind of just seems like a conspiracy theory, but when you think about it more, it kind of makes some things click into place. Like why was it reported when they drove immediately to the hospital that the secret service agents started cleaning everything out of the car and that they scrubbed it clean of all evidence? And a lot of people didn't even realize that there was three rows to this car. It's a very unusual make and model. And I remember when I was a kid, they used to show pictures of this, but it would be zoomed in so you couldn't even see the front row of the driver and the passenger. And then I started to realize something odd in that every single picture I could find, they've cut out the face of the driver or he's obscured. And there are so many examples of this where he's literally in the shadows and they've cut his face off. Again, he's faceless. He's blocked out in the shot. And even in this photo, he's completely cloaked in darkness, whereas you can see the other driver of the car perfectly. Even when I was going online, they were labeling it where they were showing what the other driver's name is, but they weren't even putting this guy's name in there. And honestly, go look. Almost every single photo from this day, you cannot see the driver's face, but you can see everyone else in the car. This would completely clear up the single bullet or magic bullet theory, because it wasn't a magic bullet that hit both the governor and JFK. 
There were multiple rounds getting fired up into the air, that's why they never found the evidence. If this conspiracy theory is true. And the Warren Commission even found that it would have been impossible for the governor and for JFK to both been shot by the same person. Because you can see in the film that they were hit at about 20 frames apart. But the rifle that Lee Harvey Oswald allegedly used, it would have taken two and a quarter seconds or 40 to 42 frames of the film. And most people agree that the single bullet theory is essential to why the Warren Commission just blamed everything on Lee Harvey Oswald at acting alone. People bring up how the term conspiracy theory wasn't coined until after the JFK assassination. But AP News did an investigation and they found that that's not true. That whole thing goes back to the assassination of Garfield. It's interesting that this term conspiracy theory keeps coming up when presidents are taken out. It's almost as if they don't want us to look further into it. So if you're old enough to and can stomach it, I would recommend going and watching the Sapruder film on YouTube. There's multiple versions. People have the original version as well as ones that are slowed down, enhanced, uh, more frame rates as well as resolution. And take a look and see for yourself because now once I, I can't see anything else when I watch this. And honestly, this just would make so much sense. But this is all alleged and just a theory. Man, I cannot believe after all of these years, we are still talking about JFK's assassination. And it's by far one of the best conspiracy theories I've ever heard. Because there's so much evidence, but not enough evidence, you know? There's a lot of things that really make you question the assassination of JFK. I am kind of a believer that it could have been the driver. When I see all of these new clips coming out of the driver potentially turning around and things like that in his seat, it does make it seem like maybe the driver is the one that ended up shooting them. And that would have been something that I would have never have guessed in a million years until it got brought up to me. Let me know in the comments, what do you think happened? Do you guys think that Oswald did it? Or do you think that maybe somebody else or it was the driver that did it? Hey, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and like the video and subscribe to the channel. I only ask once per video and I make a video like this almost every day. And to everyone that's subscribed to the channel, thank you so much for being subscribed. And to everyone that's not subscribed, I still appreciate you nonetheless, thank you for watching. And don't forget, if you want to be a part of Questions for DK where I answer personal questions, questions about conspiracy theories or theories in general, leave a comment starting with Question for DK so that I can find it in the YouTube search results and answer those questions in a future video. So we recently found out that plants scream when they're being damaged, but are they sentient? And for that matter, are robots sentient? Buckle up because it's going to get real weird in here. First off, yes, plants are sentient. All life is sentient. That is the ability to perceive your environment and react to it. When it comes to things like cognition, that's a different question. Are they having conscious thoughts? Now, be aware that plants and bacteria also have memory. They encounter stresses and they can react more quickly when they encounter them again. This is a very different question than consciousness. Consciousness as we know it is the perception of self. One of the famous experiments is putting a dot on an animal's forehead, having them look in a mirror and see if they wipe it off, showing that they perceive their reflection as them and not another animal. The ability to recognize oneself in a mirror varies between animals and even within individuals. By the way, yes, penguins can be self-aware. The argument against robotic sentience is they're simply executing lines of code. But right now, scientists are working on incorporating the little human brain organoids, which are tiny human brains grown from stem cells, into robotics. And I think when we're talking about a living thing, the question of sentience and consciousness is not if, but when. There's also the question of whether or not we are actually making conscious decisions or we only think that we are. Our decisions are based on a complex combination of instinct that is pre-coded into us and memories which have shaped our interactions with the world. This goes into a much larger and more complicated question of whether or not free will exists. I also saw that you said you took too many shrooms when you were young and that led you to have hallucinogen persisting perception disorder, HPPD. Can you yeah. explain what this is? Well, that condition is classified by persistent visual snow, floaters, morphing objects. Like I see them right now. I see them all the time. The, the snow is in the room. The snow is definitely in the room. It's all over you. And uh, basically, it wasn't that I took too many shrooms. I think that it was, I took, I took about an eighth of uh, semi-essence mushrooms, which are the ones that come from the earth instead of cow shit. 
And I took a, an eighth of those at my friend Toby's house and which is a normal amount, but I was in eighth grade. So I woke up the next morning with these extreme, you know, visual distortions. And I thought that it would go away. I tried to make it go away, but there was, there's really no cure for HPPD. It's a lifelong condition. So it's just a matter of dealing with it and realizing that it is only visual. So when people ask me, Hey, I have HPPD. How do I cope with it? I say, remember that every other sense that you have, what you can hear, what you can taste, you know, your feet on the ground, you're still on earth. You're still here. Well, you said it's only visual. Mm -hmm. And yes, gratitude for being alive at all. It's yeah. great. But you said that this led you into some dark psychological places like depersonalization disorder. Yeah. Depersonalization is the feeling that you are not real, but that reality still exists. Derealization is the idea that reality itself is an illusion created by your mind and that you're the only person alive and that everything that your brain is projecting to your visual cortex is a lie and that you're the only living human being. Both are pretty uh, intense. HPPD creates both of those things. And so when I've talked to people who have the condition, it's really either or, but more than 70% of people with HPPD fall into either category. They're both coping mechanisms for the, I, I don't know what really happens. I talked to a researcher once named Dr. Abraham. He lives in upstate New York. He's the leading scientist when it comes to HPPD research. He's the only one who actually seems to care about finding a cure. Mm -hmm. And the only known treatment right now is alcohol and benzodiazepines. That's not good. Right. So alcoholism, something that came into my life pretty early. Alcohol abuse as a result of that experience, because that helps with the visual symptoms, makes some of the static go away. Man. Never tried benzos, though. So which, so can you explain to me where in that spectrum you are? Like, So do you sometimes have a sense that you're not real? Sometimes. And something else is not real? Like the reality is not real? Yeah, I experience it all the time, you know. But like I said, my job helps with that because I get to feel like, um, you know, when you seek out extremes to a certain extent and you put yourself on the front lines of intense events, whether it be politically or socially, or just dive into deep fringe subcultures, you get this feeling that you're real. And being filmed is also a confirmation, if you can look at the MP4 file, that you're in fact living here on Earth confirming yeah. that you were in it with reality by watching yourself on video. Exactly. So the, is that basically the engine behind all the extreme interviews you've done? Well, I got HPPD around the same time that I began this journalism course in ninth grade. So I sort of always used journalism as a therapeutic mechanism to deal with some of these symptoms, especially depersonalization. There's some pretty good illustrations of what it feels like. It kind of feels like you're trapped behind your eyes or that you're just this like nebulous soul that's trapped in a flesh suit that you're not really a part of. You're sort of puppeteering a flesh and bone skin suit. Trapped or just the ability to step outside of yourself? You feel like your soul is not something that is connected to your body. It's something living in your head. It's really hard to explain to people who haven't gone through derealization or depersonalization. But if you go on support groups, they always say like, how do I break free from behind my eyes? Like dark stuff like that. Oh, so you're trapped. I mean, there's a higher state of being through meditation that you can kind of step outside of yourself, mm -hmm. but this is not that. Unfortunately, it was kind of the meditative path or, you know, the Eastern path that I took and kind of fused that with psychedelic culture in Seattle that took me down the psychedelic use rabbit hole in the first place. So like, <laughs> I'd say it all started with Siddhartha. Siddhartha, that's a good book. Have you done shrooms since then? No, I don't really do psychedelic drugs, but like a lot of people think that I'm against them, which I'm not, it just doesn't work for me. If it works for you, I'm sure that can be really fun. Especially, I know there's lots of like uh, therapeutic uses for acid and ketamine and psilocybin, but I personally abstain from those kind of, anything psychotropic I try to stay away from. Drinking a bit? Well, yeah, I mean, I didn't drink at all before I had the HPPD stuff. And I would have drank later in life, but definitely like 14, 15, Every day after school, I drink a, a 40 ounce of Mickey's. It's like a, it kind of looks like old English, but the bottle's green and it has a hornet on the side of it. Just kind of became a ritual just to deal with the anxiety of, of that situation. Wow, that's really crazy. I did not know that this was a side effect that could happen from doing certain psychedelics where it's pretty much just a long lasting effect of psychedelic activity. That's pretty scary. I mean, luckily this individual is handling himself well and he's making more people aware of it. That's awesome. But that's got to be exhausting to always just be on a constant trip at all times where it feels like you're just 
looking through a window at all times, it's got to be extremely fatiguing. Have any of you guys went through these symptoms? Have, have any of you went through derealization? Like, that seems to be a really big one when people take psychedelics. Let me know in the comments. You can now move to Italy and get a house for one euro. Yeah, I'm not joking. Now you're probably thinking random rural places that you wouldn't even want to go to, so what's the point? But no, I'm talking places that you know like Sicily and Rome, so stick with me. So this was originally an initiative starting back in 2010, trying to get more people to move to Italy. A lot of the population who live in these more rural places are moving to the major cities or from the outskirts of major cities into the city. So to try and increase the population and get people to move there, they started this initiative. And to do this, they are literally selling homes for one euro to foreigners to get them to move to this place and inject life into the country. Now, what's the catch, right? There must be some kind of crazy thing that, you know, oh, it costs a euro, but then once you're there, you know, you actually have to pay 10 grand a year or something, which, I mean, still be cheaper than a lot of places. But no, in most of these places, they just say, right, you can have the home for one euro, but within three years of moving in, you just need to do it up and make it look a bit nicer, which, you know, isn't going to cost that much. There are 58 towns and cities across Italy that are participating in this, meaning you can literally take your pick. Now, no, you're not going to get a flipping great big mansion, but you're going to get something pretty decent and it's in a beautiful place in Italy. You can't get much better than that. But if you do want something which is extreme luxury, they're selling them for 5,000 euros. So, yeah, so I mean, the state of the flipping UK at the moment, yeah, I'm not considering it. But yeah, let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. I'll see you in the next one. The power of now. Yes. Living in the now. Yes, well, that yeah. really is all there is. Right. There is only now. Look at your watch. It's always now. Right. It's never then. I, I think, it's yeah, never I've will be. Dial it's always now. now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, in the words, I think, let me paraphrase, I think it was uh, yes. Mark Twain that said this, you know, he said, we've got kind of a conundrum here. He yes. says, plan for the future, because without a doubt, the future is where you will spend the rest of your life. We understand the idea, we understand the sentiment, and Noah's saying you can't plan, but the idea is that your plan has to contain an opportunity for spontaneity too, because you have no idea what's actually going to happen. So, continue to plan for the future, but live in the moment yes. and allow for spontaneity. Absolutely. Okay, there we go. Thank you. Does that help? Yes. You're welcome. <laughs> If you've never experienced a glitch in the matrix, this is probably not the video for you. So just continue scrolling because you're going to think that I'm crazy. If you have experienced it, I want to know if anyone has experienced anything similar to this, especially from a young age. So I've had multiple glitches throughout my life, especially now that I've gotten older, I can understand what's happening. But this is, I want to talk about the very first one. The very first one that I can remember that I was like, Am I crazy or are all of you crazy? <laughs> so this is around fourth or fifth grade elementary school. My grandma would pick me up from school two to three times a week. We were very close. My grandma lived like rock throwing distance from my house. So I would literally travel up the creek through the woods to my grandmother's house that I would go. I would spend all my time with my grandma. So after school, she would pick me up and we would go to Wendy's. That was our thing. We loved Wendy's. My grandma has very prominent blue eyes, like crystal clear. It's a very prominent feature about my grandma that she has very blue, piercing crystal blue eyes. So this one day, she picks me up, we go to Wendy's, we're sitting in the glass area. If you know Wendy's back then, then you know what I'm talking about. We're sitting there eating our fries and I look up at my grandma and my grandma has brown eyes. They're brown. And so naturally I was like, grandma, your eyes are brown. And she was like, yeah, Lauren, I have brown eyes. I was like, Grandma, no, you don't. You have very blue eyes. What do you mean you have blue eyes? And she was like, no, Lauren, I have brown eyes. So whatever, we eat. She takes me home. And this is a whole thing. I talked to my, my mom, too. And I'm like, Mom, Grandma has brown eyes. And my mom was like, yeah, Grandma has brown eyes. No, she doesn't. She has blue eyes. What do you mean she has brown eyes? Like everyone knows that grandma has blue eyes and everybody was making me believe that I was crazy. The next time that I see my grandma, three days later, my grandma has blue eyes again. So of course I'm like, grandma, your eyes are blue. Why are your eyes blue? And she's like, yeah, Lauren, I have blue eyes. What do you mean? 
What do you mean? What do I mean? We just had this conversation three days ago when you had brown eyes and I told you that you had blue eyes and you're telling me that you have brown eyes, but I know that you have blue eyes. And now that you have blue eyes again, you're telling me that you know you have blue eyes? I'm not crazy. This was not a dream. I did not dream this. This happened. I was, this was reality. I mean, it was like Monday on, on Thursday. Now you have blue eyes again. Like I did not make this up. This is still with me to this day. I think about this to this day. My grandma had brown eyes that day that I went to Wendy's with her after school. I didn't make that shit up. Like that was reality. I didn't miss a day. Like this happened. Has anybody else ever experienced anything like that? With people's eyes changing colors? And they like, they fully believe that their eyes were a different color. I'll never forget that. <laughs> I didn't have anything with my relatives that was similar to this. If any of you are aware of the TV show Mythbusters, there is an individual on that show, one of the hosts, his name is Adam Savage. This was almost 10 years ago. And this is including my wife and some of my best friends. I remember very, very clearly that Adam Savage passed away. He, he, he died due to health reasons. When he passed away, my friends invited me to a Adam Savage passing away party because we were celebrating Mythbusters and the crew that ran on Mythbusters. And we celebrated Adam Savage's death. I know that sounds weird, but we celebrated in a sad and good way, you know, to remember Adam Savage because we were really huge fans of the show. Never happened. Adam Savage never passed away. People tell me to this very day, and that's my wife and my best friends, tell me to this very day, that we never had a party for Mythbusters or Adam Savage and that that never happened. And I mean, I agree that must not have happened because Adam Savage is still alive, but that was not the reality that I am in now. That was a different reality, I'm telling you. And it makes me feel crazy because people question me as if I'm crazy. But I guarantee you, I remember eating the cake and also watching Mythbusters that whole day. It, it was a thing, <laughs> but people say it wasn't. And also Adam Savage is no longer deceased. So I guess I'm just crazy. It's a very hard thing to describe. It's a feeling that I can relate with this individual greatly because I swear I'm not crazy. Has anything like that ever happened to you? Do you guys think I'm crazy? Do you think this individual is crazy? Because it does seem extremely crazy. I'm sorry, NASA just found what? So Interstellar is actually real. So a while back, NASA discovered this planet, which is 100 million light years away from Earth. You're not going to be going there tomorrow. Now, on this planet, there is no land. It is just full water, like Miller's planet in Interstellar. Now, stay with me. It gets a lot crazier. Trust me. Every 11 days on this planet is one year on Earth. If we somehow, God knows how, managed to get faster than the speed of light, and in whatever way we managed to get to this planet, if you stayed on this planet for like, I don't know, a year, when you came back to Earth, it would probably be destroyed. But literally though, if you stayed on this planet for, say, a month or two months, you'd come home, you'd be the same age, but everyone on Earth would probably be dead. I can't get over it, it's insane. It's absolutely insane. Well, time distillation is real, we know that that's a proof and fact, and it is absolutely mind-blowing. So everything you see in Interstellar actually isn't that far fetched, although it would take a bloody long time to get there. Everest has about three tons of poop on it. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> and, and now it has, uh, now it's like a thing where you, ha you actually have to carry um, poop bags, bag. uh, poop bags that are reusable up to seven times. Human poop. Human poop, because yeah. people would just poop everywhere on there. And yeah, apparently people sense. would fall and it would, it would be terrible. Like it's, yeah, it's gross. You know the thing about the height of Everest? It's 29,000 and 32 feet or it used to no, say 29,000 and two, two feet. It used it now says 32. It used okay. to say two, but the first guy who measured it. Yeah. Measured, what are we talking about this? Who know? Oh, okay. it wasn't. Okay. I got it. But yeah. It's 29,000 feet. Exactly. And he was like, no one will trust my math. And so he added two feet. Like, yeah. Just, just to throw it off. It does not seem like a place that you would want to poop, but it's rich people poop. True. Um, <laughs> maybe there's gold. <laughs> Josh stepped in human poop one time. Oh, we talked about it a couple times. Barefoot, uh, right? But... Yeah. Oh, no, in Crocs. In Crocs. In Crocs. <laughs> uh, That's so terrible. Yeah. We totally talked about this on the podcast. I don't think so. I think so, but I can't remember. 
The following footage is from a witness and his fiance. They had decided to take a quick getaway into a family's, a relative's cabin. And over the course of several days, they were literally being tormented by some unidentified creature. Finally, on the last day, the witness begins recording the events. And it's basically, he couldn't take it anymore. They eventually left the cabin. But the question remains, what happened to them? What was terrorizing them? What was the creature? Take a look at this video and tell me what you think. My fiance and there's been this, come on baby, there's been this like, no, no stay there, stay there, don't come over here, I, I don't know what the fuck it is. There's been this thing, I don't know, do you hear that? There's been this, someone or something is outside and they've been fucking, <laughs> they've been fucking with us. <laughs> they've been fucking with us for weeks now. We're renting this cabin out from one of our family friends, my uncle. What the fuck is that? It's been making noise for weeks now. There's another house down there, but I don't like this. I don't like this at all. The biggest thing that I don't like about this video is how squeaky that bed is. It's a really squeaky bed. And, I don't know, this could possibly be a real video, but I have a feeling that it's a fake video. And, or maybe, it's their uncle just playing a joke on him because he is renting it from his uncle. That's a good possibility, even though that would be kind of a crappy move to make as an uncle. But nonetheless, squeaky bed, scary atmosphere. What more in a creepy TikTok could you ask for? All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and end the video here. As always, if you found any of these clips interesting, links are in the description down below. And with that being said, have a good day.